there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. This is the team of Island Air. Every day, they risk everything. The Kodiak Peaks and Wicked Seas make the island the world's most treacherous place to fly. These are the tales of Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys ready to load up? Whenever you are, yeah. Right. Island Air is more than just an air taxi service for Kodiak. They are essential to the well-being of the entire island. Island Air, they're definitely a lifeline because we have no service that goes around the island and delivers goods. This is how people get their mail, their food. So they are an integral part of our economic engine here. I got for you. Everything you move in a car down south, in your truck, in your delivery vehicle, it all moves in an airplane or a boat in Alaska. Cargo! I've been on a few different uh, search and rescue type flights. I've picked up uh, people that have had heart attacks, burn victims, and a pretty wide variety of uh, medical emergencies. It's the interaction between everyone out in the bush and, and, and helping them and helping them help us. It goes both ways. Here, Pete. Thanks for the mail you want to grab. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, this is awesome. The benefits of being the mailman out in Kodiak. <laughs> the pilots serve a wide range of clients, including the watchmen at Alaska's closed down canneries. I have a presence on site. I just keep an eye on things. I enjoy all the fishing and hunting, and it's just been a hoot since I've worked here. Throw them in it. <laughs> For some caretakers, Island Air is one of their only links to the outside world. Hey, Pete. Island Air brings the mail here. They bring my groceries with on the mail plane. They're kind of a lifeline. So how's weather in town? It's starting to look kind of nasty out to the northeast. Yeah. So. yeah. There's a lot of people that I'm the only guy they see every week for months at a time. So you kind of got to give them five minutes, let them talk to somebody face to face. All right. Oh, handbag. Yeah, good. All right, mail that. All right, thanks, Pete. Hey, I found some graffiti on the wall you might be interested in seeing. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. Let's have a look. Okay. You really kind of get to develop a relationship with these guys. And if they don't walk down to the dock or walk down to the beach when you pull up, it could be scary. I haven't had that happen yet, but uh, you're always hoping that they're going to be there waiting for you when you pull up. <laughs> All right, Lance, we'll see you next week. See you next <laughs> week, brother. Watch that tail back for you, Lance. Like that. Oh, yeah. The bush pilots are my heroes. Sometimes Kodiak's violent weather prevents the planes from landing, halting delivery of vital goods and medicine. This weather may dictate what we're doing or where we're getting into. The ceiling invisibility down there is great. It's just the wind. When large ocean swells are the only issue, the planes have another way to distribute supplies. Uh, the beaver itself has got a, a camera hatch that's up underneath the belly. So it's possible to lift up the door in flight, fly over a spot and throw all the equipment out that you can. Today, Eric will be teaching Pete how to use the camera hatch for target practice. It's another page in the training manual for Alaska's ultimate bush pilots. We got the orange tape. We'll kind of set up some targets with the orange tape, and then got a couple cups of uh, flour in each one of these. That way, if, even from the airplane, when it hits, we'll see it spread out, and that'll mm -hmm. give us a pretty good idea of um, how close or how far we are from our target. Cool. So. Considered the best bush plane ever made, the Beaver was designed for this type of use. 
is just a cool made airplane. They're really thinking when they put this thing together. Eric and Peter will travel to Three Saints Bay, 20 miles southwest of the basin. With its long stretch of beach, it's the perfect location for the training. But obviously, you're going to want me dropping it before we actually reach our target because it is going to have that forward velocity, you know. All right, I got the hatch set up, Pete. So let's, uh, let's set up our target. Are you going to take a look on the first one, or? Yeah. No, we're also playing with the wind factor here. The high winds will make it that much more difficult for Peter to hit the target. Now give me a heads up, all right, we're over the beach, and then like a three, two, one drop or something like that. Peter's first pass will be low, just a few feet above the beach. All right, so we're lined up with our target. See that X pretty good. All right, three, two, one, drop. <laughs> Pilot Peter Rosendahl is learning how to deliver supplies out of the Beaver's drop door. See, that acts pretty good. Even with guidance from veteran pilot Eric Howard, Peter's first drop was off the mark. under his belt, Peter will now climb an altitude to 500 feet above the beach. Increasing wind speeds will make it extremely difficult to be on target. All right, so we're lined up. Three, two, one, drop. How about them apples? Aren't we better do it again, see if you're uh, actually good or if you're just lucky? Yeah. Once is a fluke, twice is a real deal. Peter will now jump to 700 feet in altitude at full airspeed. I kind of want to try to do a slam dunk. Drop. Pretty cool. <laughs> he proves he is the real deal by dropping just two feet away from the target. No, I don't want to say I'm good at this, but... Doing really low. <laughs> this wind's really thick. All right, this is the hardest part. Turn around back in here. Yeah, just keep it wide. Getting a little gusty in there. So, I think our axle is about to get blown away. With wind speeds increasing, Eric and Peter need to head back to the basin, but not before they have a little fun with the rest of the bags of flour. Also, show how many we can drop out in one go. Yeah. I drop it three, two, one, I drop it. Alright, one out. Good right. job, Pete. Oh, but you got it down pretty good. It takes hours of intense training to get to Eric and Peter's level of skill. Some would shy away from that much work. Others embrace it. Yeah, if I could fly all day, that'd be amazing. David is a new pilot to Island Air. Originally from California, the call of the last frontier was too strong, and he moved to Alaska a few months back. So it's going to be one out at a box. Cool. Coming out to Alaska was an easy decision. The flying is comparable to nowhere else, I think. Bob 
only hires experienced pilots who have finished traditional flight school. We have the new guys that are coming in all the time. They've got lots of energy. They help get us old guys off the couch. But I've found that as I look over all the accidents that have happened, you know, a lot of times it's in those pilots that are at the top of their game. And that's when it's, it's good to, to put a little experience in going, no, it, it can happen to you. I'm looking just for whether you know the basics. So today, Dave and Bob are heading to Calson Bay to see if Dave's got what it takes to make the Island Air team. We're going to climb up and do a 60-degree bank turn, stabilize it, and then I'm going to have you go to a 60-degree bank turn in the other direction. Got it. He knows what faults to look for in a pilot, and he knows how to fix them. It's only had one person fail the intro ride, really? and that person actually ended up dying in an aircraft accident a year after he failed that intro ride for the very thing I failed him for. If you want to survive, if you want to keep your passengers alive, if we want to live, we're not going to be cowboys out there. We're going to keep things safe, so. How many Gs do we have in a 60-degree bank turn? A 60-degree turn, it's two Gs. OK, I want you to maintain the altitude you're at. We have 2,600. Go ahead and roll into a 60-degree bank, left turn, stabilize it. All right, right turn. 63 bank turn, full aileron. Being able to feel the tight turn and fly by the seat of your pants. OK, left turn. Is something you learn through training. I'm not pressed back into my seat. And more training. I'll tell you right now, you're not going to make it. You're right. Not, how are you going to make it? You're too high. Bob is on a routine test flight with Island Air's newest pilot, Dave. Do a couple clearing turns. And he's taking every opportunity to put this rookie through his paces. OK, left turn. Got to make a quick turn. You're looking down here. Yep. So you don't really see it. You got to pull it back to feel it. Which makes a big difference when you get in a pass and you're looking outside. Now, what I want you to do is keep the wings level. Keep the wings level. He likes to see it when we start shaking in our seat, literally. He likes to kind of push us to our limit, see if we're going to crack. And that's part of his determining if we're going to be a good pilot for his crew. We've got the municipal airport right under it. If we had to pull the power from right here, would you make it? Yes. You just lost your engine. Roger. Tell you right now, you're not going to make it. You're right. Up How are you going to make it? Tell me right now. You're a line pilot. Lengthen it out. Lengthen it out. Lengthen it out. Get to 80. You're too high. A 60 degree bank causes the plane to lose altitude, so the pilot must consistently calculate, feel, and compensate. Bob's training puts pilots in situations to test emergency procedures of all kinds. A stall, the airplane losing lift, is a situation that every pilot will face eventually. Our power. It's better to practice now and feel it, so when it happens, you instinctively know how to react. No power, we're just flying. We're starting to feel the stall right now. Buffett, we're coming into it. A lot of times there's a horn. Nose kind of falls off. Full stall. Very good. OK, your airplane. My airplane. I feel in tune with the aircraft, but I'm human. I'll get scared. Most emergencies, people will inevitably freeze for the first couple seconds. That's right. Got to have our procedures down, so I just do it automatically. It's easy to get comfortable, isn't it? Sure. That's what it gets us. Well, good thing to do is constant training. That keeps us sharp. Yeah, it does. I can already tell I was rusty on that simple engine failure procedure. Yeah. OK, head back. All right. You can either fly or you can't when they come to me. I, I go out and figure that out really quickly. What I want to know is what they think. Then we walk you through the scenarios to, to teach you how to apply them for our environment. He knows of all the 
dangers, all the accidents that have occurred up here. He knows how to avoid all those things. So he gets a brand new pilot like myself, and he's going to jam this new information into my head. I took a check ride once, and the FAA inspector, he's standing underneath the flaps. I started to drop the flaps. Well, bam, bopped them <laughs> on the head. I looked at him and go, well, have I failed it yet? <laughs> Do we need to keep I don't think there's anybody quite like him out here. You passed it. You got to keep working. All right, thanks for the tough love. <laughs> Part of flying is, is your preparation. Looking ahead, what's going to happen next? Or what can get me in the scenarios we fly at? That things start happening pretty quick. Let's go on down, and we'll see how you do. Rigorous training in this environment is critical. Add a little power. Cut it, cut it, cut it. Even experienced pilots will run into the unexpected in Kodiak. Then it started to do the bull backfire. Pop. Bob knows firsthand that complications on this island hit without warning. It was late winter. I had loaded up two passengers. We back taxied out of Paul's Lake in the ocean. And the way the wind was, I had to take off towards the shore, if you, if you can just imagine, inside of a horseshoe. And we back taxied what I considered was plenty of room. I was going to do a single float turn, get airborne, just continue my turn right around. And I simply started to run out of room. But I was at a point, if I tried to pull my power, I knew I was going to wreck the airplane. I instantly went to, I have to use every single inch of this space that I have. I ended up, uh, it was within 10 feet of a rock wall. If you screw up the landing, you're going to wreck the airplane. If you screw up the takeoff, you're going to get killed. Most Alaskan bush pilots have experienced their fair share of trouble in the air. If you screw up the landing, you're going to wreck the airplane. If you screw up the takeoff, you're going to get killed. And Bob is no exception. And we back taxied what I considered was plenty of room. I was going to do a single float turn, get airborne, just continue my turn right around. and. I simply started to run out of room. I ended up uh, was within 10 feet of a rock wall, turning in an accelerated stall. I could feel it starting to go, and I had to just keep it on the ragged edge. And I ended up touching the water, stalling, and staying perpendicular to the rock wall at the same time. And we bounced through the, the little reef area in the water, and I was able to just keep the plane moving and flying and, and flew back. I tore up one flow pretty good. And I think that's one of the moments I, uh, I, I asked my maker. We had a little conversation. But I, I, was, I was very upset at myself. And I told him I, I came very close to, to putting him into an accident. So. I've learned that healthy awareness in my flying is not to relax and keep asking yourself what could go wrong in the next situation. Bob has had a number of close calls over the years. But what is the veteran pilot most afraid of? What frightens me? My wife's not happy. <laughs> that frightens me. First job in aviation, and it will be my last job in aviation. Bob's wife, Jen, has helped him make sense of the dangerous profession he's chosen. She walked into our office over at Municipal Airport. So I looked at her and immediately smitten. I said, hey, Joel, I'll give you a quarter for your sister. As I remember, he said 50 cents, and I reached in and I paid him. 
<laughs> right there. And uh, we were married six months later. I think my wife's pretty good looking. Yeah, you weren't here the day the guy gave me a hundred dollar tip. When she's getting a little too much attention from the guys, you know, I just come back and uh, I just give her a little squeeze. I just mark my territory. <laughs> If you've seen the movie, The Cronks, they're having earthquakes and the rocks are falling and the dad just reaches out and puts his arms and his body over everybody to protect them. And that is Bob. So I remember I started crying in the movie because that, that was you. Uh -huh. And Lydia and I looked at each other and I was like, that's dad. She goes, yeah, that's dad. He's very, very protective of his family. We're, it's his world. Bob shows that same fierce loyalty to the people that work for him. My family up here is definitely the Stanford family, and everything that good that happens for Island Air, I am really happy about. When you hit the water, <laughs> I'll, I'll come in. Everybody works together like a family. Even our, our customers are, are treated like family. So this is showing 4.2 on Alpha Kilo. After uh, flying for uh, Bob for a number of years, uh, he's pretty much become like family. He may not be a friend, but he's definitely family. Good job. <laughs> you win the lotto. I don't get great jobs unless it is a great job. Oh, man. A lot of living going on around <laughs> this company. I get a lot of calls from pilots that want to come up. My job is to find that commitment and then you can join our family.